Okay, welcome everyone. Today we'll be going through probably one of the most important aspects of behavior management. Now, as you might be aware, or if you're watching this, you'll be uh, most likely very acutely aware that behavior management is one of the most important tasks of people who work in schools, particularly primary schools and high schools. And in fact, it's probably the number one reason for stress and anxiety and high turnover rate of teachers and teacher aides uh, in particularly in public schools. It's also the number one factor that contributes to the amount of time that students spend on learning. So obviously, if we were to improve the amount of time that students spent on learning, you would naturally think that over a period of time, students would score better or work towards their goals at a faster rate, and so there would be better outcomes at the end. So that is the reason why behavior management, or one of the reasons why for what the, for why behavior management is so important. Now, one of the first elements that I like to talk about is the root causes of behavior. And that's because quite often we treat the surface behaviors. Now, the surface behaviors are what we see. So if we see a student talking or throwing things or generally mucking around or kicking a chair, whether it's real basic annoying things, uh, what we call disruptive behaviors, or it's the more serious things, what we call behaviors of concern. Either way, those what we actually see in the classroom or in an excursion or wherever we are, when students misbehave in that way, we're only observing the surface behavior. Now, sometimes the surface, now obviously it is important to consider the surface behavior and react to it, but there's also a step that professional educators do and very experienced educators do, and that is consi to consider the root causes. And that's because we treat the root causes and not the surface behavior eight times out of 10. In fact, we actually treat both of them. So we react to both the surface behavior as well as the uh, root behavior or the root cause behind that behavior. And in fact, identifying the root behavior means that we treat the surface behavior in a very different way. So they kind of relate to each other. They have that interconnectedness. And let me just demonstrate that on a brief little diagram. And this will make more sense as I go through and give you examples. So basically what happens up the top here, the first thing that we see when we're in a school is some type of uh, behavior. Now, quite often we'll call that, uh, that will be the surface behavior. And again, that can be just the basic things like uh, throwing things, throwing pieces of paper, punching another student, swearing at a teacher, so on and so forth. So this is the basic things that we visualize with our eyes before we analyze the reason behind it in any way um, whatsoever. So we'll change pen here just to make it nice and colorful. Now behind that surface behavior, we have what is known as um, a response. Now the response that we should be providing The response that we should be providing is in quite often is in reference to this surface behavior. Now, our response is all the various different behavior management type techniques and strategies and ideas and um, telling students off or corrections or pre-corrections and so on and so forth. So uh, this is the normal sort of procedure that you will see in a standard classroom if you just walked in and you had no idea about behavior management techniques, you would see the surface behavior, and then you would see the teacher or the teacher aide with some type of response. Now that response, um, however, should be affected by, or most, most, is most effective when we actually consider this part even before that, so the preceding uh, reasons for that behavior. So that's called what we call the root cause. So this is what you're probably used to seeing if you walk into a classroom. And now I just need you to, or would like, if you're studying this, to see you looking one step behind, I guess, one step in advance. Normally we go in this direction, but in this case, we're sort of already at the end because quite often we know a lot of appropriate responses. The whole purpose of this isn't to teach you different responses. We can do that uh, at a later date um, or in different videos. For this video, what we're looking at is 
going to the step earlier and thinking about what happens before the surface behavior. So this is kind of like why the child would do this. And generally speaking, there are, there's quite a few different reasons for, um, well, there's quite a few, yeah, there's quite a few different root causes. There's, well, in fact, there's dozens of them. There's probably about six to 10 that we usually talk about quite often, such as um, attention seeking, it could be caused by a disability. There's a various different, there are various different reasons. Now, sometimes the root cause is irrelevant. And that's, for example, if a student throws a piece of paper and it's just a simple little thing, it's just irritating. Johnny, don't do that. Go pick it up, put it in the bin. It's very simple. We don't have to worry about it. This doesn't apply all of the time. But if it is more serious behaviour or if it's repetitive or if it's social in nature or just as general good practice, you should always consider what was the root cause of that behaviour. And again, sometimes we don't have to spend too much time there and we can just tell the student, we can just correct the student, that's just called a correction, um, and um, problem solved and then we move on. Sometimes we just do a low key response, problem solved and we move on. But sometimes we also want to look and consider what those root causes are because that means that we can do this thing, the response, which is the treatment. I like to call, I prefer to use the word treatment, but response is exactly the same. If that root cause is not the same as the surface behaviour or it isn't obvious when we look at the surface behaviour, um, then it means that we need to treat it or respond to it in, a various, in various different ways. So um, to give you an example, if a student is... Uh, in class, talking a lot, being really irritating, constantly interrupting the teacher, um, constantly getting out of their seat and moving around, annoying other students, typical off-task behaviour, what we would normally consider off-task behaviour, or even attention-seeking behaviour. So here, all we see is just some type of irritating behaviour, all those niggly little things. And you'll see novice teachers or novice teacher aides or those who haven't really been trained properly in behaviour management, unfortunately, um, they will treat that surface behaviour. So the student gets out of their seat, their response is get back into your seat. And your typical behaviour management textbooks um, don't really go too much into this detail here. They'll usually do things like uh, the uh, matching the behaviour with an appropriate response and so on and so forth. So that sort of floats in this area here. And if you've seen a lot of my other videos on behavior management, then you, would have, uh, you will have seen things like escalations and so forth. So an escalation doesn't so much take into account the root cause. It really looks at the surface behavior and it says, okay, this is what the student is doing. This is a minimal necessary force. That's another video I've got. Minimum necessary force um, and applied to that behavior to stop it from happening again or to put in appropriate consequences and so forth. So that's around this kind of area here. It's uh, responding directly to what we see, usually immediately, um, again, based on, based on what we actually observe and experience in the classroom. And it generally doesn't take into account any of the root causes. Now, if you're in a class and you're there for a long, long period of time, say you're, if, you, if you're just walking into a class for five minutes, it's not really going to make it, if you're there for an hour or whatever, um, and you're doing temp work or those types of things, sometimes going this far back can be a little bit more difficult. But if you're in a class for a longer period of time, say you've got these students for a whole term or two or three times a week for an hour, or even if you're the full-time primary school teacher, you definitely want to start looking at the root causes as often as possible. So, you know, not always when Johnny just decides to throw something. That's not really that important. You know, it's just one of those niggling, annoying things that happens all the time in a classroom, kids being kids. That's fine. We can look at the surface behaviour and go, don't do that, get back on with your work type of thing. But in... It doesn't hurt to look at the root cause more often than not, even just for a split second. And if we're having ongoing problems, those that 5, 10, 20% of students who are more of an issue when it comes to behaviour, when it becomes when it comes to behavior management and their behavior in the classroom, that's where we start looking at these root causes and what's going on. So in the example that I was talking about, let's follow through. We've got a student who's always out of their seat, so out of seat. So this student is constantly getting up, moving around, doing various different bits and pieces, annoying other students, really disruptive. Probably a really nice kid, someone who the teacher get alongs with, uh, gets along with, sorry, doesn't swear at the teacher, isn't necessarily aggressive, but they've got all these surface behaviours 
that add up to something different, to a different picture. Now, in that case, the root cause for that behaviour could be a range of different things. Now, that could be an undiagnosed disability or disorder like um, ADHD or some type of um, processing disorder like auditory processing disorder or something like that. It could be task avoidance because of fear of failure. It could just be that um, desire to socialise. Um, it could be a need to be the centre of attention. Um, so there's a range of different root causes there. Now, if we determine that the actual root cause of that surface behaviour is a fear of failure or um, uh, and sort of an escape reward mechanism where they're seeking to get out of doing work, they want to get in trouble to be removed from class, um, then treating that type of behaviour happens very differently or is, or is approached in a very different way than co continually looking at all the little different bits and pieces or even putting all that together and saying, look, putting this pattern of behaviour together, this is the problem, um, therefore we're going to put you on a red card or we're going to put you on some type of behaviour um, program or behaviour um, system that means you have to get it signed off every lesson and if you don't, you don't get to go on the camp or whatever. So um, understanding that root cause in this sense means that we might say, okay, the reason this student is doing all these things here is because they aren't that competent. They don't have much self-esteem uh, and they're very much worried about failure in front of their uh, friends. Maybe they're just lacking motivation um, or maybe it could be that they're drinking two litres of Coke at lunch and then being on a massive sugar high for that particular lesson. So again, there can be more obvious reasons for it, in which case how we deal with the surface behaviour is going to change. So in that particular case, if the student is uh, really worried about failure in front of their friends then, uh, or in failure in front of their peers and they've just in this entrenched habit of avoiding doing work, then we would start looking at how we go about um, helping them to achieve micro goals, scaffolding their work down into much more smaller chunks, uh, moving them to a separate part of the room, thinking about whether we can um, do some type of remedial instruction or catch-up instruction, uh, any type of differentiated instruction. They might be able to participate more so in the class by being the scribe for the teacher. Um, so there's a range of different ways that we can either, if they're attention-seeking type students, then we can get them involved more so in the class. And that way it gives them something of an outlet for that attention, that need for attention. If they're avoiding doing work then and avoiding that sense of failure or they're feeling frustrated or whatever, maybe there are some glaring gaps in their core skills that just need amending. So um, we can go about trying to fix that up. And that's not to say that that won't work because it's sometimes it can be quite difficult to diagnose the real root causes, but then on other occasions um, it's quite simple. So that gives us the ability to have all these different responses here and we can actively, what we're doing here is instead of just reacting here, we're thinking proactively in many cases. This is where the proactive type um, activities happen and systems and processes get put in place. The pre-corrections, the behaviour plans, um, or even just thinking through those tiered responses. So if the student does this or a student does this, what are we going to do in reference to and knowing what the actual root cause is? So um, conversely, if the root cause is something like a disability or disorder, then you might have other problems yet again. Um, so for example, if uh, the student is always trying to socialise here and always out of their seat and always walking around and trying to get the attention of other students, that may simply be um, a lack of understanding in how to um, go about making friends and participating in a way that is socially acceptable. So in that case, um, sometimes that root cause is the need to socialise and um, misdirected need to socialise, I guess you could say, uh, and in which case doing some other types of activities like social stories uh, might also work. In the world of applied behaviour analysis, this something very similar to this is used Sorry, something very similar to this is used quite a lot for students with disabilities um, because the idea is that uh, a student will have these surface behaviours um, and quite often they can be escape, escape what is known as escape motivated behaviours. So they'll be kicking chairs or having a meltdown or whatever 
Now, the root cause of that is what's really hard to diagnose. And quite often, in other words, what we're looking for is why did that student have a meltdown or why did that student seek to um, escape from the class uh, and then to do all these behaviours here so that they could escape. And in this sense, we don't really care so much about that behaviour. We don't care that they kicked the chair or that they were crying and all this kind of stuff. What, we're, what we really care about in terms of behaviour management, in terms of the long-term um, improvement and so forth, is looking at what those triggers were. So in ABA, they call those, put that in a spot where I'm not going to have any room. In ABA, we call those triggers. Let's see if I can write this way. Probably not. G, G, yeah, so that's a trigger. So something triggers that behaviour and then that leads to some type of surface behaviour. So we might see uh, a student with, say, autism, uh, might have that meltdown. And then from there, there's some type of reward slash response. And what we're trying to do in that case is replace that reward. So the surface behaviour might be so the meltdown, the reward might be escape. So here, this, this actually then changes to the reward. And in that particular case, because we know what the root cause is, we can treat the trigger, so or the triggers, so we can try and prevent it from happening. But we can also look at this particular point and change that reward. So the reward here is that they get to escape, so they get out of that situation. Um, and we can replace that with a uh, reward that is more preferable both to the school and to staff, um, but also to the student. And we can play around with different ways in which we might go about doing that, although it's you know, a relatively simple process anyway. So um, as without getting into those more uh, those programs that can get a little bit more uh, complicated, and just one other thing, by the way, that what we're trying to do here is, again, this is a term that comes from applied behaviour analysis, is we're trying to make that behaviour extinct. So that surface behaviour, we're trying to make it extinct. That's the terminology they use. It's called extinction. And that's the idea that, again, we don't want that to happen. But how do we prevent that from happening is we need to know that. So because if all we ever do, if a student has a... A meltdown or a tantrum or they're running away or whatever, if we're only ever treating that um, without really thinking about what caused it. Because with students with autism, it could be the weather, changes in the weather. It could be um, a certain volume in the class or some other stimulation that has set them off. It could be a certain topic, a certain time of the day, um, knowing that uh, it could be a change in their curriculum, in their, in their lesson plan or their, their daily activity. Instead of doing mass, they come in and find that the math teacher's away and suddenly there's a relief teacher and the relief teacher's going on with something different. So um, anyway, identifying and, uh, and understanding those root causes uh, is really important and the precursor to be able to do this so that we've got a different response. Now we can play around and try and change that response slash reward so that it's different or we are the ones that respond in a slightly different way um, in the case of what we were talking about originally with your sort of standard general classes. So... Um, that might make things a little bit more confusing, so we'll just rub that off. But if you are working with students with autism and whatnot, then um, or any type of neurological or learning disorder, global developmental life, uh, delay, um, ODD, ADHD, not less so ADHD, um, any of those processing type disorders, um, that ABA stuff certainly does apply. So, okay. Now, next thing I want to do really quickly is just write up a list of some of the more common causes, some of the more common root causes that you can potentially consider. Now, we're not talking about, uh, I probably shouldn't have mentioned applied behaviour analysis because it does get a bit confusing here, but I just want you to think in terms of this is the stuff that we see a student do. The cause is slightly different to, or there's, there's a reason that might not be known to us that's not, it's not obvious, I guess. So we have to really stop and think, why is the student behaving in this sort of way as opposed to simply reacting to what they're doing? Um, and that means we're going to change our response based on that information, sort of a combination of the information of that and that. We're going to change what we do um, and the way in which we go about uh, trying to address that particular problem. So one of the most obvious ones, 
Let's use black. My purple's not running with. One of the most uh, obvious ones is instructional strategies. Another one is social, sort of a social need, I guess, need to socialize. Now, instructional strategies basically means that um, that includes, or I'm going to include within that resources as well. So that's curriculum, resources. Um, you're doing your, by curriculum, I guess you, you, I'm referring to the teacher's curriculum or the teacher aid's curriculum, not say your national curriculum or whatever it is. Um, we're looking at things uh, like your activities, activities and planning and so on and so forth. So, but um, if you've seen any of my instructional strategies video or my teaching skills and strategies type videos, um, then you'll know that there are hundreds of those. And to give you an idea, if you're doing something that I like to call the set and circulate method, which is where you're setting some work for a student and then you're walking around, or for students, and then you're wandering around the classroom for 15, 20 minutes expecting that students will go on with their work and you're having a huge amount of behavioural problems there. That, I call that the set and circulate method. It's not a bad method, it's one of many, but if you are having problems uh, and you are doing that, then I would recommend considering changing things up and watching my explicit teaching video or my other videos, uh, well, any of those other videos that um, involve any of the sub, I suppose, areas of explicit instruction because with that you do faster pace, faster, uh, more momentum. Um, watch my video on setting goals um, and guided learning, shared learning, modelling, whole part whole learning, deliberate practice, uh, so forth, so on and so forth. So changing up your instructional strategies, and there are literally hundreds of them, um, is one of the reasons that can... Uh, uh, be, uh, be allocated, I guess, to this root cause box. So if you're doing some, if the strategies that you're using aren't appropriate for that age or aren't optimal for that age or that group or that ability or whatnot, um, then that can lead to a bunch of these behaviours. Now, it's easy enough for us to say, well, they should behave because they're kids. But uh, yeah, in the real world, that sort of attitude isn't, doesn't really get us anywhere. In the real world, we actually have to do something about it and changing up those instructional strategies is one of the best ways to do it. That applies for adults as well. So I teach adults a lot and uh, we've done certain strategies where a completion rate is abysmal and you change up your strategies and your completion rate's close to 100%. So it's not just uh, kids that this applies to, it also applies to motivated adults as well. Motivated and mature uh, adults, it makes a difference too. So the other one you've got is your social needs. So we sort of went through that before, your social needs is that instinctual, uh, students with that instinctual need to want to be friends, to be accepted by their peers, and so on and so forth. So another one is um, task avoidance. And that, that really is that fear of failure type thing. Fear of failure. And it's also fear of what I call loss of face, which is a term that I guess means to um, not be embarrassed, but to, um, yeah, I guess that's the closest word that I can think of. Loss of face means that they, yeah, I guess let's go with the word embarrassed. Um, yeah, that's probably the best way to describe it. So task avoidance, quite often task avoidance is caused by that fear of failure or that expectation of failure or the, or the um, uh, frustration is another one that causes it. So lack of motivation is another one. Lack of motivation is usually attributable to all of these because, as we always say, kids are motivated. They might not just be motivated to do what you would like them to do. Um, just going to change pen here. I'll just write a couple of other ones up. Oh, that one's even worse. What do you want? It wasn't working. Right. Mental health is another obvious one. Medical is another one. So I don't know if you can see that. I'll move in two, two seconds. Medical treatment or um, I guess drugs is another one. Learning, difficulties, disorders and disabilities, which again, we've already uh, been through a lot of them. Environmental, environ. Or contextual, there are quite often called contextual factors, those environmental uh, reasons. P 
power is another one. Revenge. Uh, temporary issues. Yeah, social need. I guess another one that I'll put in there is attention seeking. So yeah, these sort of overlap each other. I'm not, they're not specific categories that are you know, defined or set in concrete or anything, but certainly there's this idea that some students are behaving in certain ways because they want attention, whether they um, uh, want the attention of the class or they're just overly extroverted or, again, they're high on sugar or something. Um, but sometimes there are particular students who are known to be attention seekers. Um, that is slightly different to that student who has that heightened sense of social need to be accepted, to and so on and so forth. Now, when I did my social stories video, we were talking about students with disabilities and the way in which uh, a lot of students, particularly those with disabilities or, or low, I guess, social IQ, if that's a thing, get in trouble because um, they're trying to get the attention of another student who they want to be friends with. And the only way they know go, the only way that they know about how to go about doing that is to punch them or steal things or to pinch them or call them names or something like that. So in that case, the surface behaviour there, which is punching a student or calling them names or whatnot, um, doesn't match the root cause. So the root cause is need to socialise, surface behaviour might be kicking or something like that. And of course, if you then go about trying to treat that surface behaviour by just punishing that student without teaching them, punishing that student for the surface behaviours without teaching them about the root cause, or not teaching them about the root cause, trying to help them solve those root causes. And that doesn't mean you can't have natural consequences for the surface behaviour, um, but you've missed out on an entire element there that's going to prevent it from happening again because pure consequences isn't going to reduce that social need. All you're doing is changing their motivation so that they've got this, what I like to call the risk-reward calculation. So if the, um, the reward, the social need or the... Or the uh, the situation in which they get to socialise and they, or they get that attention or whatever, if that reward in the student's mind is up here and the risk is down here, even if there is consequences, they may say, well, the reward's here, the risk is here, and I know I'm going to get in trouble, but I don't care because my need to socialise is so much higher than um, you know getting detention or whatever. I don't really care about that. So, um, yeah, just anyway, that, bear that in mind for those ones. Task avoidance. Again, these things are all task avoidance, but this specifically means the student is keen on or is dedicated to avoiding doing whatever you've set. So there can be other reasons for that. That's not to say that these are all in isolation necessarily. Of course, it can be a little bit of task avoidance and obviously task avoidance kind of lack of motivation is really the same thing in a sense, right? But there's a bit of an emphasis on this bit and there's a bit of an emphasis on that one. Motivation isn't normally a temporary thing that happens on one day where task avoidance can happen on Monday but not Tuesday. So again... Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But either way, um, there's a slightly different emphasis uh, depending on those different reasons. And um, I mean, this list isn't, um, isn't comprehensive or anything and it's not necessarily um, in any particular order, but it'll just give you an idea, just gives you an idea to start thinking about those root causes and different ways to attack it. Okay, mental health is obviously one, particularly mental health that is developing. So... Um, if you're teaching high school or upper primary or whatever, you may have students that are depressed, but they weren't depressed last week or they weren't feeling anxious last week and it builds over time. So those negative feelings sort of over time are going up, right? And they're going up, up, up. And you might not notice it until about here um, and this is where they're doing whatever. And in a sense, they quite often are doing that to get attention. So um, if you have ever dealt with students who are suicidal, um, who are on drugs and things like that, or in gangs or homeless, which I have quite a lot, um, then you're not going to notice that here, but you start noticing that they are, in a way, they're using uh, behaviour as a way to communicate to those around them that they're not happy. Um, and one of the only times they get to really do that with any real effect is when they're in a school environment. So just be aware of that. Sometimes this here can be um, students who are, abnormally argumentative or their behaviour is starting to go in a direction that is unusual for that particular student. So that can quite often be um, causes of or caused by or the root cause is sort of either depression or anxiety or whatever. So um, that's men mental health. And the other thing I'll point out with mental health is I guess there's this natural assumption there around that 
students who are depressed are going to be sad. It's actually not the case. It's normally not the, well, I mean, I'm no expert in this area, but the students that I've dealt with in the past weren't, um, weren't overly aggressive. There's probably one or two that come to mind, but most of those students who I found out later were really depressed are usually the ones that seem to pre pre present in class as actually being quite happy. Um, and then you, and you just notice little changes and things. So um, anyway, just be aware of that. And uh, yeah, just be aware of that. Obviously, medical treatments and drugs and things, that significantly affects kids. Um, any experienced teacher will tell you that one of the most annoying things is when parents change the drugs that their kids are on or experiment with different doses and things, send their kids to school, and suddenly that kid just starts behaving very differently and is very difficult to manage and so on and so forth. Sometimes that can be, and this does happen all the time actually, um, a change to the dosage or a sometimes a doctor and parents will get together and want to experiment with different types of drugs or there's this new drug on the market or let's halve their dosage and see how they go or this or that or whatever um, and suddenly, but that, and, that, and you won't find out. So um, just bear that in mind. Obviously medical treatments of various different types um, can affect the way in which students behave. Uh, learning difficulties, disabilities and disorders can obviously change the records. I think we've spoken a lot about students, particularly with the disability part of it, uh, sorry, the disorder part of it, uh, and how that can, because disabilities are normally physical, right? So obviously that's going to change the way in which students behave and things like that, it's particularly if they don't have a disability and then suddenly they do. Um, but it's really the disorder side of things where we have issues as far as behaviour is concerned, um, like some of the ones that we've been through so far um, in this webinar. So uh, if the... And, and that changes things a lot because um, two students who behave in the same way, uh, if one has a disability and one doesn't, we're going to treat them and we're going to treat that behaviour in two very, very different ways. So if you have a student that has a very low IQ, who's in a special needs centre, who um, has, a, has a meltdown, even if they're, say, 12 years old, you're going to treat that very differently to um, the same aged student who is, say, has just an average IQ in just a normal class, that student has a breakdown, you're going to st and start screaming and throwing things and running away uh, and hasn't done that in the past, then you might be looking at what else is causing that. Something else might be causing that and that's something that you then need to um, have a think about carefully because it could potentially be something more serious uh, that needs addressing in other ways, particularly not just around the surface behaviour. Um, it might... The, the root cause might need to be addressed to ensure that that behaviour doesn't continue to trend in the wrong direction um, and doesn't repeat itself uh, and that parents are aware of, are aware of the fact that uh, this has happened and that you're not sure of why because it's been a sudden change. Um, environmental is also called contextual. Uh, and... Um, that basically means changes in the environment at home, so or things that are outside of our control as teachers or teacher aides or education professionals. This happens with adults all the time, where um, you get halfway through a course or, and something happens where the kids get sick or someone dies or even a holiday or you know anything can happen, a change of job, a divorce, millions of different things that can happen. Quite often, obviously, this is sort of related to the medical issue as well. If someone's diagnosed with something, when they're three quarters of the way through a course or whatnot. Um, and with kids, exactly the same. Parents um, going through a hard time. There could be domestic violence at home. There could be, um, it could literally be sort of like an abuse, neglect type situation and so forth. So obviously that's going to affect um, the way in which students, students behave. I and mean, if they're not sure of that evening, if they come to school, they haven't eaten in two days and they're not sure of where they're going to be sleeping that night or whether mum and dad have spent all their money on drugs or whatever, then um, they're not really going to care that much about your algebra or your essay structure or whatever. Um, but that root cause for that behaviour and that lack of motivation is slightly different, means that you will treat and respond to that or may treat and respond to that in a slightly different way 
um, than if it's a student who, for example, uh, is potentially on a new type of medication to treat AGHD or whatever. Um, okay, so next one we have power and revenge. These are extremely rare. A lot of the behavior management textbooks uh, and programs and things talk about this, this power and revenge students as if it's a thing that happens all the time. It, does not ha it very rarely happens uh, unless you're working in a behavior school then you're never going to see power and revenge. You may see students who are just very difficult and very challenging, but I don't think any student wakes up in the morning with the clear view and intent to try and seek and assert themselves as being more powerful than the teacher. There's always, almost always, another cause for it, uh, whether that's just a sheer will to not do work because of a lack of motivation or because of something else. Now, obviously, if you're working with students with disabilities and disorders, that may not always apply. Um, but again, it's not in that case, it's not so much a power issue anyway. Um, it's caused by something different. So it's caused by a, uh, something behind the disability, like one of the symptoms or whatever. So, um, And of course, revenge, which is probably even worse than power seeking. So uh, revenge is where, um, you know, yeah, revenge is just much more serious than power seeking and of course that's where if students are in trouble and they they might turn around and then steal things from the teacher or whatever but you're talking about students here who have things like um, uh, ODD uh, oppositional defiant disorder uh, and the various other iterations and types of those but I don't think you're ever going to come across those students and if you do then well, you're extremely unlucky and they're probably going to be in some type of behaviour school anyway, in which case you'll be working with teachers who already know all this stuff like the back of their hand um, and well then you'll know we generally call them either power seeking students uh, or revenge seeking students and again extremely rare. Uh, if you think you've seen one of these or you're dealing with one of those students then uh, I can almost guarantee you that you're probably wrong and it's probably something else. Uh, that's not to say it doesn't exist, but I don't think no student wakes up in the morning thinking, I'm going to go to school today and make my teacher's life hell. No students ever, very, very few students ever think like that. So not to say it doesn't happen. These are, this is, I guess, what you would call evil through lack of a better term. Well, probably really is. That's what we're talking about here. Kids that are just evil. So they have that psychopathic sort of tendency. Um, and even those that do have diagnosis along those lines still generally aren't power seekers. Manipulative, maybe, but that's different from being a power seeker and certainly different from revenge. So uh, the reason I keep this one in here, even though it's, as I said, so ridiculously rare, I think a lot of teachers that have, if you took 100 teachers that each had 40 years experience, they still would never have seen these type of kids. So, but I keep them in there because um, every now and then I do hear people talking about this and um, I do see it in a lot of textbooks, particularly written by people that a lot of textbooks aren't written by teachers or experienced teachers. Um, they're written by people who haven't worked in schools before. And I think that's one of the areas where you just got to be aware of. If you do a PD on behaviour management, this stuff very, doesn't really happen. It's usually something else. Okay, so, and then you've got temporary effects. Now, a temporary effect can be any of these, and it basically means that it's something that just happens today. So I like to think that they're the type of ones where you can just forgive and forget effectively. You don't need to be um, spending a huge amount of time doing some type of behaviour plan or going through some type of process, calling parents and so on and so forth. If it, the reason for that behaviour is identified as just being temporary. Sometimes it can be kids are just having a bad day, they're not enjoying themselves, they said something accidentally, and you just have to not forgive them. I mean, you, well, you certainly have to forgive them at some point, but you can treat the surface behaviour, and the root cause might just be, it's just one of those things, it happened. The kid was just, didn't have much sleep, whatever, got in a fight at recess, came in the classroom, really upset, swore at the teacher, ran off. Um, that doesn't mean that that student is some type of power monger and it certainly doesn't mean that the instructional strategy is wrong. It doesn't mean that they're attention seeking. It could look like it. It doesn't mean that they're task avoiding. That's not even their main goal. That might be an effect of how they're behaving, but that's not a goal. It's not a medical thing. It's not a mental health thing. It's not a disability thing. That, and the other thing is too, I mean, that, in this example, that student may have a disability or a disorder. 
but that actual behaviour wasn't caused by the disability disorder. It was caused by just a temporary effect of just having a negative social interaction at lunchtime. So anyway, they are, that's the basics of root causes and this idea that whenever you're dealing with behaviour, um, just treating the surface behaviour is not always the best way to go and we should quite often consider the root causes of what's going on and what is causing those behaviours that we see. Um, and I've gone through and listed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different uh, types there. Although there's a few extra ones here, I guess. But um, there are a lot more. There can be lots of other reasons. These are kind of categories, I guess. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I think if you don't remember all these, then that's perfectly fine. As long as you're thinking about, I'm seeing this, but something different might be causing it, then that's the whole idea of root causes because it gives you the ability to treat it in a different way. Bearing in mind that our response is normally not just a single response, it's normally a multi-pronged response. So it might be um, some type of correction there and then, some type of error correction or some type of reprimand there and then, but it may also be a slight instructional change or something like that. So if we know more that, particularly if we know that it's happening to more than one student, if there's multiple students who are suddenly acting a bit weird and not quite on task as you would expect them to be as usual, yes, we can respond to it and do those corrections and things to the surface behaviour, but then you might start to think, well, there's a bit of a pattern happening here, so maybe something else is going on behind the scenes. Maybe it is an instructional strategy type problem and I need to start, um, you know, instead of doing this model where I'm setting the work and sort of circulating or we're doing group work, maybe we need to can that a bit and start doing more fast-paced uh, fast paced instructional type work where it's more teacher-centred and then do pair work. We'll do group work maybe another day once we're more on top of things. So um, other root causes, by the way, just off the top of my head, time of the day is a good one, a very common one. Students are behave really well in the morning, may not behave after lunch, particularly if they've been playing sport and they've just run 3Ks running around kicking balls and things like that and you're trying to get them to sit down and write essays or read books and things. So that can obviously be a root cause. So if you know that students have just got this huge amount of energy because they've been running around and they just ate all this sugary stuff or whatever, then obviously how you treat that's going to be slightly different to if the student is, um, has a disability, for example, or is um, avoiding work, uh, task avoidance for, you know, purely because they don't want to do that. So um, you're, gonna tr you're potentially going to treat the way in which you deal with that particular uh, issue in a slightly different way. So that's, the, uh, that's my take on the root causes of behavioural issues.